it's going to be very important. And then two, I'm going to share my screen. I'm just waiting for. Let's try that again. The body attacks its own cells. Okay. Overproduction of the B lymphocyte stimulator cells. That's true. All of those things are true. The question is, how does all of that happen? And that, that's, going to, that's going to be our focus. So that way we, we understand what's happening with these B lymphocytes and how they play a role. So with that being said, I'm sharing my screen. You should see the whiteboard. So <clears throat> yes, the cells do attack themselves. They do not recognize that the cells that are there belong to them. But what ends up happening is that you, you have a person that may have sensitive or sensitivity. So if they have sensitivity, then they may have something called the sensitivity gene. So this individual uh, will now uh, be susceptible to getting lupus because they have a susceptibility or a sensitivity gene. And one cause of lupus, not it's just one of many, one cause of lupus is um, UV radiation, so sunlight. So when this person is exposed to sunlight, then if they have enough sunlight exposure, the cells of the DNA can now become damaged. So this makes the cells or damage the cells. So what ends up happening is that the cell undergoes what they call cellular death and it now produces apoptosis. So here you can have a cell. So here's your cell, your nucleus, da da da. And then now this cell will become like in several pieces. And then you have your nucleus material that is like now out and available. So when that happens, then the apoptotic bodies are these tiny little pieces. And this here, these, this here is apoptosis, all of these four pieces here. And now it exposes the inside of the cell. So this material here, this was the inside of the cell, the nucleus included. And so now those things are exposed, the DNA, the histones, the um, other proteins, and it now becomes exposed to the rest of the body. So this susceptibility gene affects, uh, the, that it has effects on the genes or the person, it now makes it susceptible to the antibodies not recognizing it as itself. So their immune cells start thinking, hey, this, this stuff, this foreign substance, although it really is their own, doesn't belong to us. So this is what they would now call the nuclear antigen. Once all of, all of the insides are exposed. The other thing that happens is that your susceptibility gene can't clear. So once these cells broke, break down or, or apoptosis occurs, then it cannot clear it and it cannot eliminate those bodies. So therefore you end up with increased antigens in the body system. So you have a decrease in clearance and you now end up with more of the nuclear 
antigen. Once that happens, all these nuclear antigens are floating around and then your B cells, which we talked to someone mentioned in the chat that the B cell lymphocyte stimulators are now available. So now these B cells that are floating around will see this um, exposed material and think of it as not being itself and then build up antibodies to the nuclear antigen. So now we have the presence of the anti-nuclear anti antibodies. So that's how that process starts. And then you end up with antigen antibody complex reaction that happens from that. Then it gets into the bloodstream. Once it's in the bloodstream, then it can either deposit itself on, you know, other organs and tissues, or it can stick to the vessel wall and the kidneys, the skin, the joint, the heart, it could be in several different areas. So once it's deposited, then the inflammatory process begins. And so it causes damage to, you know, damage to that area via the complement system being activated but on the cells of, and tissues of the organs that it, it affects, it's going to leave the membrane dysfunctional. And what I mean by dysfunctional, so once it travels to another area, so say it goes to the kidneys, which is one location it could go, the cell membrane that would normally be whole, now the cell membrane has openings on the cell membrane. So now fluids can go in and out of the cell freely, so it makes it more permeable. So now we have fluids that can come in, fluids that can go out, and it's nothing that can control it one way or the other, so any fluid is free to go in and out of the cell. And now the cell becomes damaged or the tissue becomes damaged. What type of hypersensitivity is that known as? Type three, correct, Jessica. So this is known as type three hypersensitivity. So we don't want this to happen in healthy tissue or healthy cells. But if you had a foreign substance or if you had an infection or an infected cell, you do want this to happen. So basically it's happening to healthy tissue when there's no actual cause for it to happen. Other things that can trigger this process could be smoking, it could be viruses, it could be bacteria, certain medications, um, estrogen, um, isoniazid, which is what we talked about in TB, Hydralazine, they use that a lot to help with management of blood pressure. So those types of medications can also trigger this process. Who tends to get this more and when? Do men get it more than women? Do women get it more than men? Is it the elderly, the children, um, people in their reproductive years? Who gets it more? Women get it 10 times more than men. So it's more common in women than in men, 10 times greater in their, during their reproductive years. Whereas women still get it more than men, but the, the level of how they get it is less. It's two to three times more common um, in women and men compared to their childhood or if they're over 65, which is known as their non-reproductive years. So there's um, type two hypersensitivity. What is type two hypersensitivity? So type two.
What is type two? When does that when does that occur? Okay. Give me an example. We got allergy. So type two develops when they target other cells like your red blood cells and your white blood cells or the phospholipids. So when those areas are attacked, then that causes phagocytosis and that destruction will lead to additional symptoms. So what the other signs or other sign or symptom related to SLE, if, you know, based on your book, talked about, um, you know, the blood cells, right? Besides the skin lesions. Right. What specific DNA? Well, what is what lab value is very specific to lupus? So ANA can be used in any of the autoimmune diseases, but there are two that are pinpoint specific to lupus. And one is the, one is the DS DNA. What's the other? It's going to be the anti DNA and the anti Smith. Not that ANA is not used to actually check, but it is. But the two that's pinpoint specific to lupus are going to be the anti and DS stands for double stranded DNA and then anti Smith. And those are primarily found um, the anti-Smith targets the ribonucleic protein and the anti-DNA or double-stranded would be seen um, during the active disease. So once the disease is active, then it's more visible. So you still can have, you know, use your ANA that lets you know that there's some type of autoimmune problem. You still have your C-reactive protein that still lets you know that, you know, we have an issue there. And it's, very, it's not clearly easy to diagnose. It's difficult to diagnose because of the various portions of the body that it can affect and it affects people differently. So one person, two people can have SLE, but they will not have the same signs and symptoms. So there's some criteria that would help us understand um, that this may be SLE. And your book outlines that they need to have so many of the symptoms, right? What would be the symptoms they would need to have? So you need to have four or more of some of the immunologic symptoms and they gave you the mnemonic SOAP brand MD. So you have the rashes, that's the first one. And you can have a, a malar rash. And the malar rash is that butterfly rash that you normally get over the cheeks and around the nose. And that's when they've been exposed to sun. Let me clear that so we can outline these symptoms. All right, so they need to have at least four or more Let's 
greater than or equal to 4 out of 11. Okay. And so of the four, they would look at the rashes. So they could have the uh, malar, the discoid, <coughs> pardon me, move over my whiteboard it was sliding off off my box um besides the rashes what else would we be looking at they can have uh <clears throat> they can have ulcers right somebody wrote that so we can have rashes, we can have ulcers, and those ulcers can be, um, they're gonna be either in the nose or the mouth. They can have the mucosa that's affected. That's what that would be from here. Then we, that's the inner layer. The outer layer is the serosa. So they end up with serositis. So that would be, if it happened to like the lungs, then they would have pleuritis or they could, if it happened to the heart, then that could be pericarditis. Okay. We have the joints that can be affected and we need at least two or more joints to be a part of that, to be um, considered potentially lupus. And so that would be another, another concern. So usually they have some type of arthritis in those joints. We also have the kidneys that can be a play a role in that as well. Somebody posted that in the chat. <clears throat> And usually with the kidneys, they're going to have an abnormal urine protein. And they may also have, you know, difficulty um, or uh, difficulty, but diffuse proliferative. Glomerular nephritis. that S on there, there we go. So that's another issue that can happen. Um, photosensitivity, we talked about that earlier, but it, it definitely bears bringing up because that's how those skin lesions, some of those come along, so photosensitivity. Oops, there we go. We also have the brain that can be affected and so the signs and symptoms that you would see in the brain would be seizures and psychosis. So from a neuro standpoint. And we also had the blood. And with the blood, and that's where that secondary hypersensitivity came from, they can have anemia, leukopenia, uh, thrombocytopenia, then the last one would be the antibodies. And there was a couple um, because those antibodies, they can cause several issues, um, especially if it's in the heart. You know, they can end up with, if it's in the heart, they can end up with endocarditis. 
myocarditis. So end up with vegetation on the valves, the mitral valve, which would be part of that endocarditis. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of different presentations, but they would have to have at least four or more of those in order for um, them to diagnose with lupus in addition to the lab values and things of that nature. So there's quite a bit, um, quite a bit of things to, to actually look at. So although the, the antinuclear antibody, which is a large portion of the patients they have, but they also have that in other autoimmune diseases, that was the ANA. So if you have this, and I'm gonna clear screen here and look at lab values. So the labs, we talked about the ANA, but that's, you know, it would be positive or elevated, but it's, it's not specific. Um, we talked about the C-reactive protein and wasn't there a set rate? Would that be true? The sedimentation rate, yeah. So the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, either one of those. Uh, the complement system, so complement three and four. And they actually would be decreased in the active disease. And then I talked about the specific ones, which was the anti-double-stranded DNA and then the anti-Smith. Um, RH factor would be positive. And your RH factor are proteins from the immune system that attack healthy tissue. So we'd have a positive RH factor or a rheumatoid factor. We just call it the right word so we don't confuse anything. So quite a bit. So lupus is just one of those conditions where you can't say it's specifically from this, this, or this. Um, you know, generally the you know their presentation will be fever, weight loss, and then they'll have one of those um, rashes, whether it's discoid or malar, primarily malar, and then they'll have some joint pain. So. That's usually the most classic signs and symptoms that, that you will see. If you get to specifics, if it's like in the kidneys, then you're gonna have some, you know, you'll have issues with the kidneys, oliguria or urinary frequency, some type of uh, complaint there. So it depends on the organ that's gonna determine if it's gonna be a, a specific area that may be affected. Um, lymph nodes will be enlarged. They could have splenomegaly. So those are some additional signs and symptoms that the patient may experience with SLE. So chest x-ray or CT scan of the throat because they're looking for, you know, if they have, I mean, not the throat, the thorax, um, if they have any that pleuritis that I talked about before. So if it's there um, or pneuma or a pneumonia, that would be another issue. They may do some type of cardiac imaging to look at if they have endocarditis or myocarditis. Diagnostic procedures would be, depending if it's any organ involvement, then it would be geared towards that, whether it's the kidneys or whether it was the brain, then they would do um, diagnostic studies related to the brain to see if the, what kind of functionality it still has. So overall, things that we need to look at for treatment is basically manage the symptoms that the person has. So, you know, some people can have uh, lupus and it may not, you know, it may not distort their skin or anything like that terribly, um, or it, it may be all internal. So it's kind of hard to say, you know, they're going to develop one thing one way or the other. 
but we're going to, you know, if it does affect the kidneys, we need to look at potentially kidney failure, maybe needing dialysis, but we're gonna talk about, you know, how much exposure to the sun they may have. Let's minimize some of these environmental factors that have been associated with SLE, reducing stress, looking at, um, you know, potential for clot formation, because if they have the antiphospholipid syndrome, then they're more prone to more clots. So they can develop deep vein thrombosis, they can develop a hepatic vein thrombosis, they could have a stroke. So they're going to, our treatment goals is more to prevent the exacerbations and to limit the severity of the exacerbations once it's, in, once it's gone um, in action. Some other things for diet, it, it depends on the person's situation. So we're going to try to make sure they have a balanced diet and then we do restrictions based on, you know, the organs and tissues that may be involved. So if they have hyperlipidemia, then we're going to be looking more at a low fat diet. If they have kidney involvement, then we're going to be looking more at a low protein diet. Um, considering vitamin K intake, so looking at foods that may be high in vitamin K, you know, for somebody that um, may be on Coumadin therapy for, uh, to prevent clots. So we need to talk about the green leafy vegetables, the cabbage, the broccoli, uh, blackberries. Those will all be things that are rich in vitamin K for the individual to take. And that wouldn't be um, across the board for all patients unless they actually have those conditions. But oscillating lung sounds, looking at joints and making, you know, seeing if they're, they're um, painful and stiff and all of that and think about heat packs, talk about exercising and should they do like high intensity impact um, exercises if they have, if they have uh, SLE. High intensity, so like high aerobics, would that be gentle for the joints? So no, we don't wanna have them do anything like that. So swimming would be really good. That'd be a great thing to do um, to help with joint movement. Um, other things to consider, uh, safety measures because of the fact that they're at risk for injury and they may have neurovascular dysfunction. So at regular exercises, range of motion exercises, which would be good. We wanna prevent contractures, you know, support their self image, look at, investigate what type of coping strategies they use to help you know, minimize stress will be things that we wanna also educate the patient about. So what if you're not really sure of what types of exercises or what type of diet your patients should have, who could, you, who could you enlist to help you with that? Dietitian, or the food part for sure. What about exercises? PT and OT. So physical therapy can help you with that component and really help the patient. So overall, this is going to be a multidisciplinary approach. You need a physical therapist, you need a rheumatologist, you need a nutritionist, they may need some uh, case management um, to help assist at home. So some patients can would, you know, have spontaneous permanent remission some people continue to have exacerbations and flare-ups. So, you know, they try to, they need to be as active as possible using sunscreen of at least 50 or above. When you're, uh, when you are caring for these folks, you want to make sure that you kind of cluster your care too. Um, you know, talk about using heat to kind of get your, your joints a little bit more loose and less stiff looking at body alignment techniques and posture techniques, the importance of following the appropriate diet and taking their medications as assigned. And what medications can we use to treat SLE? Oh, 
steroids for sure your prednisones your owns your prednisones dexamethasones but they're going to primarily be on prednisone or methylprednisolone um so someone said monoclonal antibodies give what is a monoclonal antibody okay so how does that how does that work it's an immunosuppressant so uh belumamab it so it helps to suppress the b lymphocytes okay i like that so it it does um it, it does prevent the b lymphocyte stimulator from actually uh surviving and producing antibodies so that's what it's going to do there your non-steroidals like your ibuprofen for minor arthritis and fever or aspirin and then we have Paquinil or the hydrochloroquine that someone talked about. That's actually an anti-malarial, but why do they use that for SLE? Why are we using an anti-malarial for SLE? Okay, I can go with su suppression of the inflammatory. It's a, it's an ant, it has anti-inflammatory properties. So that's why they use the Paquinil or the hydroxychloroquine. Um, it has a category uh, C for pregnancy. So they do ward against using it uh, if you're breastfeeding or the mother's breastfeeding or if they're pregnant, they're not really sure exactly how it affects the, the fetus um, or the baby, but they, uh, they will only use it in those instances if the benefits outweigh the risk. So just kind of FYI on that. Any, any cortical steroid, um, it would if the, if the person's under stress, should they consider increasing their cortical steroids? Talk to their physician about that, yes or no? The answer to that is yes, they should. So it, it's not just for specific conditions. Anytime you're on those corticosteroids, glucocorticoids, prednisone, things of that nature, under stress, the utilization of, of that medication goes down. So they should at least bring that forth to their physician um, or the physician should really bring it forth to the patient that under stressful situations, you will probably need to increase your dose and then talk about what dose they, they should go up to. Um, we also have methotrexate and um, to help with the arthritis and the rashes and things like that. Um, if there is kidney involvement or central nervous system involvement, then the cyclophosphamide may be used. So, you know, when you're reading the test questions, yes, and then titrate it back down. That is true, Tramika, thank you. Um, when you're when you are looking at test questions and you're trying to break down the test question, if it doesn't mention you know a kidney issue or saying the patient has kidney involvement or that the patient has central nervous system involvement, then answer the question based on the information submit uh, pre presented. If it's asking you, you know, what things would be appropriate in the plan of care, well then all of those things would be appropriate in the plan of care because it's not saying that, we're not speaking about a specific patient, we're now just asking what would be appropriate in treating somebody with SLE. So does that make sense? There, there's a slight difference in the verbiage and it is semantics, but just kind of think of if we're looking at the overall plan what interventions could we do, then that would be, that would be fair game. Um, other things like uh, to treat their hyperlipidemia would be their statin medication. So they would need to do that and then consider some type of coagulation modifying medication for the management of clot formation, especially if they have the antiphospholipid syndrome. So that's gonna be very important there. One last thing, who can describe for me 
plasmapheresis. So that's another option that they can receive. Plasmapheresis, what is that? Because under stress, it would not be effective. And we are trying to minimize the steroids. It's not so much about the immune system, more so than the inflammation. So we need it to be available for that person to, to reduce the inflammatory process. If it's not being utilized appropriately, then we don't have what we need to help. Does that make sense, Ricky? When under stress, any stress. So that's why the conversation needs, the physician should be having that conversation with those patients. Um, are DMARDs recommended for SLE? Yes or no? Okay, which one? Mm -hmm. So that'd be your IV immune, immune globulin, right? Perfect. Okay. We already talked about the, hydro, the hydroxychloroquine, um, which is an anti-malarial, and that, Jessica, would be um, the... The, how it works in lupus and it's used for dermal lupus is to, it has its anti-inflammatory process. No, it, uh, hydro, hydroxychloroquine is an anti-malarial. So what you guys will learn is that you have medications like hydroxychloroquine that can be used uh, for more than one condition. So there's some crossover in medication usage that you will see. All right, um, back to plasmapheresis, because we kind of we kind of lost, uh, there's been some commenting on it, but then we start had some other questions come through or other statements come through and questions. So here, they're going to basically kind of clean the plasma of its um, of the antibodies to or the bodies to prevent healthy tissue attack. So the plasma is separated from the blood. They so spin it down, and either they're going to replace the plasma with saline or albumin, or they're going to treat the plasma and then put it back into the body system. So that's what plasmapheresis is. Whether it's you know someone else's or yours or however, that's what they're going to do. So it's basically a kind of replacing the pl repl plasma replacement. So we're gonna get rid of the, the plasma that's holding on to the antibodies that's causing the body to attack itself and then replace it with either saline or albumin or we're gonna replace it with, um, treat it and then replace it back into the body system. So we have a couple of options there that we can use with the plasma phoresis. Okay. Any other questions or comments about SLE? All right, so let's look at RA, which is another in, uh, immu immunity concern. And it's also another autoimmune condition. And so primarily rheumatoid arthritis is going to attack joints. It can go to other places. So you can have, a, you can have skin, you can have heart and lung involvement, 
but usually the, the issue with RA is that it's in the joints or in the, the joints only, like the synovial tissue or the synovial fluid. So how does that all come into being? What is the, the, the pathology or the pathophysiology behind RA? Because what's happening is we have inflamed synovial tissue and it can affect all weight bearing joints. So just like SLE, there's no cure, just like SLE, they're autoimmune. And the earlier you catch it, the better the treatment methodology is. It's another one that's difficult to diagnose. Um, Uh, what I would say in reference to, uh, Kristen, to hydroxychloroquine, I would say that although they do not have research on humans to say that this can affect the pregnancy, the physician may or may not decide to give it. And, you know, that would be up to the physician and, you know, they don't know exactly how it affects the fetus or if you nurse the baby, how it's going to affect the baby. And then they would have to make that decision together. But I would not guarantee them that it's okay for pregnancy because in that rare instance, that person's baby or fetus be, you know, ends up suffering. And even if it wasn't related to the hydroxychloroquine, the patient may associate it with that. So, you know, I would just give them exactly what a, what a category C is and what that means. And although they haven't seen it in humans, I can't say that it's not. And that would be a true statement. Okay. You're welcome. All right. So we have a lot of stuff happening here. <laughs> so I get it caught up. Okay. So yes. So the first thing that happens is the synovium is, becomes inflamed. So we have inflammatory process that kicks in. And our white blood cells go there, and they're actually going to cause the membrane of that synovium to become inflamed and thickened. So over time, you're gonna uh, the t over time it will cause the bones and the cartilage to erode. So the in that whole area, and we're gonna say for instance the knee because this is kind of a common area. And then that will lead to the next stage. So the first stage is that you have synov uh, synovitis, which is inflammation of the synovium. So the inflammation from stage one is now going to create something called a panis, which is fibrous tissue. It's a layer of fibrous tissue that is uh, surrounding that area of the joint that damages the bone and the cartilage within that joint space. So the space in between the joint begins to disappear and then it progresses to stage three. So the, the cushion that the individual had is no longer there. And now the two bones will end up fusing together. What's that fusion called? What is that fusion of the two bones called? Correct, it is called ankylosis. So once you have ankylosis, which where both of the bones will fuse together, this causes the stiffness and the inability for the joint to be mobile. So now the joint is still inflamed and it erodes to the joint cartilage and the bones causing the phalanges to curve outward. That's how it affects the fingers. So the book gives a very good description of you know, the joint and, the, and, and that usually happens in the later stages, but all joints can be affected systematically. It can also look at the heart, the skin, the lungs, and also the blood. So there is, um, you know, tell me about the abnormal finger process. 
So the joints closest to the fingertip is permanently bent toward the palm, whereas the, the joints closer to the palm is bent away from it, right? Kind of known as the swan neck deformity. When you palpate the joints, how would they feel? Yeah, swan, N-E-C-K, swan neck deformity. So when you palpate on assessment, how is it going to feel? Very spongy, soft, um, swollen, tender, it's going to be kind of boggy, okay? All right. So does, yep, ulnar deviation, which we talked about the, the fingertips. That is true. Um, some causes. What are some causes that could be related to SLE? What's the reason why people, I mean, not SLE, rheumatoid arthritis? What's the, okay, smoking. Most of it's insidious though, right? So, you know, we do wanna look at, do they smoke? Those would be some indications, family history, but primarily it's idiopathic. We don't know why. All right, hang on one second. My computer's about to die. I gotta run and get the cord. Hold on one second, sorry about that. All right, sorry about that. I just didn't wanna make a whole bunch of commotion while I was doing putting this plug and stuff in and moving around. Okay, so family history. It's also been linked to hormonal factors, um, bacterial and viral infections. So those are some additional causes that could lead to RA. Primarily what gender is affected. women yep okay so uh what else is there what type of environmental exposures
Okay. Someone goes, always women. <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, okay, so the two common areas where you will see RA is going to be in the fingers and the wrist. So we've already seen, we talked about the softness, sponginess thereof. Um, some of it can still go to neck, shoulder, elbows, knees, ankles, and feet. It can happen at any age. And um, they're going to have a lot of mobility dysfunction. Laboratory test. And then we'll look at signs and symptoms here. I'll share my screen. So what type of laboratory test? So we know the rheumatoid factor, correct, is usually positive in 75% of the folks. And how do you know it's positive? How would, what would the result show? Because you're saying it's positive, would it be high, would it be low? It'd be, okay, said rate will be increased, it'd be high. So let's kind of group them all together. So let's share screen. Okay, so with that being said, let me minimize that here. You're gonna have a positive rheumatoid factor, right? And these are labs. And remember the ANA is gonna be positive, but it was also positive in SLE. So it's, so that's, you know, just let you know, there's an autoimmune problem here. All right, then we also have the um, C3 and complement three and four. Again, they showed up in SLE as well. And they're going to be increased. Okay, SED rate. And it's going to be elevated as well as C-reactive protein and it's going to be as well increase. So we have a lot of different lab tests that we use and some of them cross over to other autoimmune diseases, okay? So the reason why, um, you know, the C3 and 4 here would be increased is because of the synovial fluid. It's gonna be very turbid and have a, it's gonna have a little, or the viscosity is gonna be decreased. But our CBC, we're looking for our white cell count. And we're also going to look at our RBCs because we're going to, and our, um, we're going to be looking at anemia here. But the WBC is going to be elevated, as well as the platelet, the platelet count. So, so we're going to be looking at the platelets, but it's going to be elevated as well. Okay. So we can do for diagnostic studies, so diagnostic tools, we can do an MRI or CT scan, we can do either one of those two, to look at the extent of the damage. Um, we can look at x-rays earlier on to see if there's any, you know, demineralization. And swelling. So as time goes on, it could, you could actually see if there's any type of erosions to the bone. You can do an anthrography and ultrasound. Those are all options. You can do a bone scan to see if you have aseptic necrosis. So there's several different things that we can do to look at, um, you know, kind of diagnosing RA. So what does the American College of Rheumatology say? What do they use? What is their criteria that they use to diagnose RA?
four out of seven symptoms, okay? So they also look at people having um, a joint or with sino, uh, synovitis or swelling that they can't explain. So they're looking at joint involvement, they're looking at serologies, they're looking at the acute phase reactant. So all of those, how long it's last, so less than six weeks, greater than six weeks, and they're you know providing a score. So they're looking at joint involvement. So if it's a large joint, um, two large joints, um, or, or 10 large joints or three small joints. So the book outlined a, a clear path. Just understand that there's gonna be three things they're gonna focus on or, or four things, joint involvement, if they have any rheumatoid factors or anti-citrullinated um, protein antibodies, if they have any acute phase reactants, so um, sed rate or CRP is elevated. So there's criteria that they use and it's not the same as SLE, but you still need to, have, those things would need to be present. But then they're looking at a score. If the score is six or higher of the possible 10, then they're looking at the person having rheumatoid arthritis. Lower scores, then they would reassess them to see if they may develop rheumatoid arthritis. So um, focus of our management should basically be on preserving the joints, you know, doing patient education related to the medications and the importance thereof, you know, checking the patient's mental status because if they do develop those contractures, especially the swan neck um, deformities to the hands, that's gonna be um, a body image alteration problem. So they tend to have self-esteem issues, depression issues. Um, these are life altering conditions and you know that leaves them with a lot of limitations to just basic life um, daily life activities so you know brushing their teeth combing their hair putting their clothes on something as simple as buttoning up a shirt or zipping up a pant um, so that's going to be some huge changes for an individual that develops ra and the fact that there is no cure so that's going to be profound um, other things we can have them do for treatment they can use um, you know, moist superficial heat, um, cold applications when the joints are inflamed, uh, paraffin treatments, they could use assistive devices. So again, we're gonna need OT and PT because they may need orthotics, they may need a, a walker, they may need a cane, um, they may need those um, uh, grabbers that they could use to get things that are, that are far away. So they're gonna need some additional pieces so that way they can continue to maintain as much joint function as possible and then working on stress relief. So how to manage the flare-ups is basically resting the joint and maybe splinting the extremity. That may be an option to do. Um, heat to treat the stiffness. So they could either take a hot bath or hot shower to kind of get them moving. Um, the cold helps, as I said before, with the inflammation. Exercises. So again, you be mindful that what types of exercises are recommended. Um, no, because it's actually in, uh, there, there was a question that came, if you splint the joint hands often or is needed, can you prevent swan fingers? Remember, this is actually happening in the joint anyway. So the destruction will still be there, but then it's going to cause limitation of those extremities, if that makes sense. So if you were to put on like a finger splint or a hand splint, then that person would not be able to use those fingers with that splint on. So it depends on how that, how that would work. But PT, physical therapy, occupational therapy would both be, um, you would need both because physical therapy would help with the, with the exercises. Occupational therapy devises the orthotics and they, they're responsible for the, the grabbers and things like that. That's what they would need. How to, func how to do this at home, how can you still button up your clothes? Here's some things that you could use, you know, fasteners and things of that nature. So it may delay, and I think that's what Dianelle's trying to say, but it's not gonna prevent the swan neck because the, the, um, the, the symptoms are still going on underneath. So you may not see it as quickly, but they will never eliminate it. It's gonna happen regardless. 
What about, um, so give me some examples of low impact aerobics that can be done. You're welcome, Jessica. Swimming, perfect. Water aerobics, walking, stationary cycling, riding a bicycle, all of those are good things that they could utilize to um, keep joints moving. And we've seen folks, if you're in the mall, you actually, they go to the mall like six, seven o'clock in the morning, they'll open up the doors for them to walk around the mall to kind of get those exercises. I know it's cute. I was like, why are these folks walking? I mean, I'm not hating on them, but it, it all makes sense. If you have some kind of joint issue to minimize stiffness, you just keep your body moving and that should help uh, minimize some of the distress that the individual may have. So, um, you know, stretching and isometric exercises, those things would um, definitely help them uh, pick up the speed. It will definitely help them along the way. Hang on a second. Sorry about that, I muted myself. I was, I was like, did I mute myself? So medications, we'll look at, um, it's gonna depend on the patient's case. You know, um, it's gonna be a combination of meds though that we can use to help them with their pain. So we we'll look at the DMARD, so the methotrexate. We look at the, um, the uh, cyclosporin and the gold salts and things of that nature. And you can use hydroxychloroquine. I did not realize that, so my bad. Also, um, check vision. What are we checking the vision for? We're using the hydroxychloroquine for the anti-inflammatory process, but what, why are we checking vision? Retinopathy, so retinal damage, so any type of retinal damage. Um, biological agents, so we have those mobs again, those mu mobs, the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors. So we saw that previously in SLE, they had a specific one that they used. Um, the celerimab is also for moderate to severe rheumatoid arthritis that doesn't respond to the DMARDs. So our first line of treatment here are DMARDs. Okay, and then we look at others, um, the anti-inflammatories to decrease pain and decrease inflammation, but we got to consider GI upset for those individuals if they're going to take like an NSAID. So we have to make sure we tell them to take it with food. Again, corticosteroids are back. So again, to decrease the inflammation. So you could have dexamethasone, prednisone, methylprednisolone. All of those would be potentials. The uh, immunomodulators, so that can also be used. Um, Abatacept would be an example of that. So there's several things, but uh, glucocorticoids or corticosteroids increase our glucose levels. So up into the 400s. So we need to make sure that we're double checking, you know, blood sugars for that. It is also hard on the skin, meaning it makes it. Um, the elasticity, it's thinner, it easily tears. So that's gonna be a concern for uh, folks that's on steroids and whether it's SLE or RA. Um, surgery, we can, they can have joint replacements, you know, knee replacement, hip replacement, they can have those done. They can have a joint removed and fused together via a bone graft, so arthrodesis. So they can have the synovium re uh, removed. So there's a, several surgeries that they could do, but we wanna try to eliminate people going through surgeries if we can. Doesn't mean we will never be able to eliminate it. it, just means that we're going, you know, we may have to, that may be our last resort, but let's try to start with treating them medically and things of that nature before we get to the surgery, unless it's super bad. So um, the adalumamod, that's um, a biologic agent and so what do those, how do they work? What is it, what are those biologic agents going to do?
Um, the pain from RA can be significant that it can disrupt sleep. So it, it depends on the individual. For the uh, biologics, yes, they're, they're basically going to be an immune suppressor or an immune suppressant. Um, oh, or immunosuppressant, that's the word I was looking for. That's, that works to help decrease the inflammatory process. So it doesn't interfere with that. So just kind of have an understanding with some, you know, if you know what the drug does, so then you know why the patient's receiving it, besides the fact that the physician ordered it for them. So it kind of gives you an idea of, hey, if this is an anti-inflammatory um, or if this is an immunosuppressant and it has anti-inflammatory process or um, responses or properties, and this, this is the reason why the patient would be receiving it. So that way, you know, you know with an assurity why the patient's getting it versus um, just saying, you know, here's your medication for X, Y, and Z. That makes sense. All right. So uh, other things, they need to get rest. So rest and exercise, um, joint support, stay healthy to help decrease those flare-ups. So we want to make sure they're doing regular checks. Um, especially if they're getting the methotrexate. So we also need to give them folic acid to reduce toxicity. Comfort measures, um, do activities as much as possible, but making sure they're you know, taking good breaks in between to give their body time to recuperate. And that's usually when your body heals anyway is when you are asleep. So this is why they tell you to try to get at least seven hours of sleep per night. And we're all making that mark, right? We're getting seven or more hours per night. I'd love to get seven hours per night. Um, we need to do very good skin care and you know make sure that um, we we help the patient you know identify where their deficits are so that way we can you know help them get to a better comfortable that I'm not going to say they're going to be completely comfortable but we want to get them to a point where we're getting them to use those extremities so yes you have this and this may be a problem but let's do some things to help minimize or delay how quickly these things onset or progress uh, still don't forget about clot formation as a potential so when they're hospitalized we're going to be looking at either the sequential compression stockings or the SCDs sequential compression devices so or they may have actually tet hose on so those are options um, other things we want to monitor them for is anemia, because we talked about that earlier. So if they have a sudden onset of increase of shortness of breath and they haven't been moving around and they're pale and tired, then, you know, we need to treat that appropriately for which things to, that means their red blood cell counts low. Um, take the folic acid if they are um, with the methotrexate because of toxicity is what that was related to. So it's to help to reduce the toxicity. All right. Um, so if their red blood cell count is low, then you know they may need blood. So that may help fix it. Um, other things, folic acid, iron, B12, and erythropoietin. So look, when they're on the NSAIDs, we talked about the GI upset. This can cause them to have a GI bleed. So we're going to educate the patient about the uh, coffee ground emesis and black, black tarry stools. So we were just basically asking what were biological agents, Chido, and, and basically what does it do? And it was an immunosuppressant is what we, what we were talking about. So it also interferes with the in inflammatory process. You're welcome. Okay, so Body systems to assess quite a bit, you know, joints, you know, you still want to check out the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, make sure there's nothing going on there. The skin for sure. Get our lab values, which we've already spoken about. So we've done all that. Make sure we have good IVs, that they're working really well. Do a pain assessment. That's going to be important in that follow-up after we give them some pain medication. Um, 
things to eliminate the stress on the joints. So, you know, raised toilet seats, that would be, ha that would be good to have. So you're going to need someone like OT at home for that. So remember that the skin will tear easily, become thin, and it can easily bruise because of some of the abnormalities in the blood counts or in the, in the blood cells. Look for signs and symptoms of adverse reactions. Um, where I talk about adaptive equipment and exercises and things like that. This is a, another multidisciplinary team approach. So OT, PT, case manager, social worker, nutritionist, rheumato uh, rheumatologist, all of those are going to be folks that are involved besides yourselves. Dietitian will be a part, uh, nutritionist will be a part of that as well. Questions about RA? What's your question about the nervous system, Kristen? Or were you just making a comment about the nervous system that's also included? Yes, you need to assess that as well. And we're going to be looking for, you know, if they are you know, depressed and things of that nature and give them time to express any difficulties that they, you know, they're having with RA. So it's not, it's not going to be a real simple path. This journey is going to be long and tedious and drawn out. It's kind of like the, uh, the individual that has to do kidney dialysis. So that would be another another issue. Should a person on glucocorticoids stop taking their medicines? Just, <clears throat> just quit? Absolutely not. So you know, that's the other patient education. Uh, otherwise, they'll end up in adrenal crisis. So we don't want to cause that to happen either. All that educational component is going to be be significant and paramount. All right, um, trying to see if I missed anything. What if they wanted to do knitting? Can they do knitting? Absolutely. So you have a patient that has, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or even SLE and they're, you know, they're tired. So we'll say, you know, they get tired in between and they know this is going to be their course of action, but they are concerned about how they're going to, you know, um, manage to take care of their kiddos. What's the concern that the patient's, you know, expressing to you? So if you have a person that's diagnosed, a woman that's diagnosed with, you know, um, rheumatoid arthritis or even SLE, and, you know, they're tired and they're, they're worried about how they're going to manage to take care of their kids when they know they're going to have these periods of being tired, what are they really worried about? Are they worried about the tiredness or are they worried about their ability as a mother to perform those duties? They're worried about their ability to perform the duties of a mother. They understand that the disease is going to make them tired, but the concern is how am I going to manage my family if I am having these bouts of tiredness? Does that make sense? So they're gonna, they can have joint pain, anything that they would experience with that, but it's gonna prevent them from doing something that they know they have another responsibility for. Does that make sense? So how do they cope with, you know, being tired and then 
managing kiddos. So just say, for instance, now you have somebody that's in this situation and we're doing the shelter in. How are we going to manage that? So I'm tired, my kiddos are home and I need to do homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I may have one or two that needs potty training, or I may have one that's, you know, needs more direction than the other two or three or whatever. Does that make sense? So when so pay attention to your your patients and what they're saying. If they already know something's going to make them tired, they want to know how can I manage my other responsibilities while I'm experiencing the pain, the tiredness, et cetera. So the plan would be how to manage those kiddos. They know they're going to have to rest, but how do I manage my, my, my family? How do I get them to a point to work with me? And, you know, for those of us that, that either, you know, have children now, or, you know, even though your children are grown, just think about when they were younger, some of the challenges that you had to endure with that. And if you put on or add on a autoimmune disease, that's going to be an issue. Someone said, LOL at Kristen. <laughs> I'm not sure what, oh, make your older kids work. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so yeah, group therapy, those are good things too, but the, the person is more concerned about their roles as a mother and, and being able to perform those duties. And you can su suggest things like group therapy, having a second person come in to help you if they can. Um, you know, you can, if you have older kids, you can make them work. That's, you know, family support, but folk, make sure that it, you understand that their concern is about their job. They understand that they're going to be sick if they, or they're going to have fatigue if they are actually, um, you know, in, if they have SLE. So, all right, so let's look at our last exemplar, which is multiple sclerosis. And this is another autoimmune disease, which is why it's an immunity. It's another autoimmune disease, but now we have a problem, we have a whole nother problem. This is not necessarily an inflammatory issue, but this is definitely a um a nerve impulse conduction or transmission issue correct test <laughs> i love it all right so here what we have going on um it, this is going to affect the central nervous system which is the brain and the spinal cord so we have the um and your book does a very good job at, you know, showing you the difference between what an actual neuron looks like with the dendrites and the body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and where the myelin sheath comes into play. So it, it does a fantastic job at that piece. Uh, my rendition of it will definitely not come anywhere close to it, by the way. So, you know, don't laugh, just, just be prepared. All right, so when you have a a neuron, then you have your, you know, this is my little rendition of a neuron. So here's your soma, and then this has the little dendrites here, but then there's a portion There we go. Of that actually goes like that. And then we have our other nerve. But I'm going to make this a little bit thicker. So maybe the book does a better job. So you have little channels of axons, or uh, which is your nerve fiber along this whole neuron. And what ends up happening is your dendrites, which are these little pieces up here, what, what's their role? They actually receive, this is an E here, a signal.
that somehow requires an action. So the signal travels down through these dendrites into the body and then it's going to go here, which is the junction between the somal body and the, and the axon. But this is where the rest of the transmission needs to transpire. So in order for signals or impulses to travel through that axon, they need to be protected or insulated. So when you have axons that are damaged, then the signal doesn't come through correctly. Or it's not strong enough. Now the damage on the on the axon could be, you know, minimal, minor, it depends, but there's destruction. So basically you have, here's your myelin sheath on the inside, and then you have your insulation part. So this continues to go through, and this is kind of the protector here. So if you start having breakdown along the protected areas, then this nerve impulse will not necessarily go through. The, the message that's being transmitted will not carry through. So there may be, it starts here and there's a disruption and a little bit and another disruption. So what gets out on the other side, who knows? So that sheath is designed to protect those axons and allow that transmission to happen. And if, if not, if it's not protected, then we're gonna have some issues, you know, distal to that initial impulse. Symptoms, again, they're gonna vary from person to person and they're gonna vary in general. So each MS person isn't gonna have the same type of MS and, and they're not gonna, I mean, not type, same type, what I mean by the same structures that are going to be affected. So you can see lesions in different areas of the body but it's going to affect the sensory and the motor, motor nerves. Again, no cure, another one of those lifestyle changes that folks have to, have to deal with. And this can happen in the brain, it can happen in the heart, it can happen anywhere, okay? So as you go, as we talk about some of the signs and symptoms, then you know, you can, you'll understand why, because that nerve impulse isn't being carried through. So the, the damaged myelin or the demyelination, that's the part that happens to the myelin sheath. So this, you know, leads to, or this here is the demyelination. So when it's demyelinated, the area that, the ner that this nerve supplies is um, will not be stimulated. So that's gonna be, a, you know, a huge issue. What are some causes? Number one cause is, again, idiopathic. So that's another problem. And so now we, there are some other responses like allergic responses that they may say may be a reason why. Um, again, autoimmune. Response of the nervous system. That could be an option. Or there could be things like emotional stress, um, a bacterial infection, a chemical exposure, low vitamin D. Those are some additional 
uh, processes along with genetics. So it could be genetically driven. Anything, anybody north of the, of the equator is at risk. So that would be North America. Uh, also Northern European ancestry are more prone. Gender, who does it affect more? Yeah, the last three that we've talked about women, it's all been about women. So this is a, got to be mindful here. I'm <laughs> curse, she says, oh my God. You know, guys have diseases too. So let's, you know, they, we can't, it can't always be them. So yes, more women. Um, again, 1545 is kind of the common age range, but usually the average is about 29. So that's when that actually, uh, uh, when you see that. Um, you know, men do get it, but again, MS is commonly seen in, in more women. So this diagnosis, it takes time to figure out what's going on. And there's several things that has to be evaluated. There's no one test that says, hey, this is MS. Um, but, you know, MRI studies or uh, that can be used to rule out, um, you know, or to see if you have any issues. So we'll look at what does... trying to clear that it seemed like it was taking forever in a day all right so we um so when we're looking at diagnostic tools so we can do an mri and what we're looking for are lesions on the mri because what's happening there is inflammation and scarring And that and no matter where it is, those neurons have inflammation and scarring to them. So you can look at signs and symptoms to rule out other diseases. Um, you can also do an LP study. What's an LP? Per um, LP is a lumbar puncture in true Kristen. They're going to look at the oligoclonal bands. They're going to look at those. And that is actually specific to MS. Okay. Um, there's some kind of electrical study that they can also do where they will elicit an electrical um, uh, signal and wait for an electrical response. So they, they, they may do that. They assess the response after the signal has been sent. How do the neurons respond to it? So basically, did they receive it? That's another option. So kind of backing up a smidgen. Um, what is the, we kind of talked about the patho, we kind of talked about people that are more prone to develop it. Yes, it is. It's called the evolved, um, the evolved potential or electrical potential, something like that. The evolved potential study, I believe, is what it is. So looking at history, things that they may complain of is, you know, fatigue, and that's going to be seen in the majority of the patient, dizziness, vision problems, like double vision or gaze. Um, one of the first signs is sensory impairment. 
So those will be things that the patient may complain of. Um, and there's, there is an array of signs and symptoms. So let's look at that. So signs and symptoms. So um, fatigued, extremely fatigued. They're just drained. So that's one. Um, that they can have speech issues or speech difficulty. And that's known as dysarthria. And they, that will be an early sign. Um, another early sign would be spasms. And they'll be very painful. Patient's very clumsy. So here, this is going to be a safety issue for falls and injuries. So their uh, coordination issues. Dizziness. Um, from a visual standpoint, they could have that optic neuritis. And here, that's this optic neuritis would consist of the double vision, you know, uh, blurry vision. seeing dark spots. They can also have incontinence um, of the bowel and bladder. From the bladder standpoint, the nerve isn't stimulated, so they may not be able to hold their urine, or they may have nocturia, or the bladder may be overactive. They can have urinary retention, and if they end up with urinary retention, because um, they can have the opposite here, so they can end up with urinary retention, and then now we'd have to be concerned. Our concern here would be UTIs. They can also have constipation. So I'll put here. Um, what's a, a sensation sign that they may have? What is that called? 